know, it really makes me sick to see food stuck in someone's braces. And, like, I wouldn't want to get sick all over your nice lunchbox. Your mommy probably packed for you all neat with, like, baggies and everything, you know? Oh, come on, Lauren. If there's to be any projectile vomiting, I want to make certain we're out of range. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a funny daddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking notes. Welcome to The Sitcom Study, the podcast where we contemplate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. And today, we're giving a salute to some of those shows that maybe didn't pass on as much wisdom as they would have liked to. What are we talking about today, Amy? We're talking about One Season Wonders, Jay. The one season wonders, the shows that were gone too soon, canceled before uh, before we even knew ye. <laughs> so there's tons of these, right? But there's a weird sort of paradox as we came to to try to choose these because, you know, ev- every year, literally since the beginning of TV, there have been shows that didn't last. But A, many of them are hard to find because prior to a certain time, you know, these things were not just archived for public consumption. And I think more to the point for us, uh, nobody remembers them or or knows about them, you know, so it's it's a sort of challenge to try to find. And there definitely are some these shows that that did make an impression on the culture. And sometimes you're sort of surprised to realize like, oh, that was only on for like 17 episodes. Yeah. Yeah. But we were specifically looking for shows that didn't suck, but were gone too soon. Yeah. And we also noticed there's a distinction between one season wonders and short lived shows. Right. So we had a listener a while back, Rob, I think, who recommended this show Grand from the 90s that I didn't remember. He mentioned that it wasn't on for that long. And I thought, great, a one season wonder. We'll add it to the list. Well, it turns out that actually was on for two seasons, even though it only had about a season's worth of episodes, just the way the years flew fall. And same thing with that weird show, Hi Honey, I'm Home from the 90s, if you remember that. So there, there's all kinds of weird factors here. But I think we settled on four pretty good candidates going from the early 80s through just a few years ago. What are our shows? We are going to watch Square Pegs, Season 1, Episode 1, Pilot, The Jackie Thomas Show, Season 1, Episode 1, Pilot, The Class, Season 1, Episode 1, Pilot, And Trophy Wife. Can you guess what the next thing I'm going to say is? Is it about a man who who took to the skies and wanted to fly an airplane? No, season one, episode one, pilot. Gotcha. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So before we get into the ones we chose, I just want to give an honorable mention to one or two that could not be found, were truly lost to time. When we started talking about this, I was like... There is a show called Mutts that was basically (laughs) like, look who's talking for dogs. And it was about a kid that like went to the pound and found a dog and we were able (laughs) to hear the dog's thoughts, you know, because there was a guy doing a voiceover and this thing, it, it lasted not only one season, maybe even just one episode We couldn't find anything about it. You were convinced that I was like Mandela affecting it and confusing it with something else. Eventually, I found as like a footnote in a blog in the back of a catalog or something was a reference to this show that was a pilot for a young Stephen Dorff, right? Like 12-year-old Stephen Dorff was on this show where he found a dog that he could communicate with telepathically it was called mutts it was on for one episode and immediately canceled and roughly 37 years later i still remember it so (laughs) you know these these things can do something yeah do you have anything like that well so the one that kind of always sticks with me 
is The Class, which we are watching for this show. And look, The Class was one of these shows, and we're going to see this repeated in many of the shows that we watch today. It was teed up to be the next big thing. It had a cast of thousands, you know, not literally multitudes, but also all like right on the brink of stardom. Yeah. I mean, when you hear the people in the cast, you're going to be like, wait, they were and they were and they were and she was that and he was that. What? Yeah. And it's not just that show. The same is true for the Jackie Thomas show, for this grand show that we ended up not covering. They often have stacked casts. And I wonder if in some cases that works against them, if nothing else from a financial point of view. So that is one of the issues that plagued the class. And so we can talk about it when we get to it. But yes, they um, midway through the season had to ax one of the cast members because they and a bunch of writers because they were running low on money and their funding was getting cut. Um, yeah. And it's a bummer. So they lost one of the cast members. And that's, of course, that is like completely demoralizing to your baby fledgling show with like, basically all newcomers to the TV landscape. Yeah, well, and in the Jackie Thomas show, we'll talk about some of the behind the scenes goings on of what to do when you don't want one of your cast members around anymore. (laughs) But yeah, okay, lots to talk about here. Let's start with square pegs. I feel like this may be the one with the longest shadow, right? Like this is the one that people I think still talk about. And I think many people our age anyway, would be surprised to learn that Square Pegs was only around for one year. Because I think a lot of people remember like, yeah, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker, that was her big thing, right? You you had that Girls Just Want to Have Fun movie and you had that Square Pegs show. Those were what I think of as like the young SJP things before, you know, all our other movies and everything. And uh, yeah, this was just around for one year. It's kind of in the vein of like Freaks and Geeks, right, where it had this kind of cult following, but it just didn't garner enough network ratings. And one of the things I think it will be interesting to track through these decades of shows is the market share that they received that just didn't cut it, because Mm. you'll see that market, market share get smaller and smaller and smaller. So Square Pegs was canceled due to ratings and some other behind the scenes shenanigans and they received a 24 share which is unimaginable yeah. in today's world that means that one quarter of the people watching tv at that time were watching this show right yeah. it's truly incredible i think if you had a one share i'm guessing right in the year 2023 if you could demonstrate that one percent of the televisions in the household were watching your show that would be an accomplishment yeah i don't know what the i don't know what the bar is these days but yeah i I mean just shocked at the like like to hear that 24 what what well you also have to remember this was a time when there were three or four channels so you know a very different time but yeah this show is immediately uh, much like the name suggests, right? The name, of course, is a reference to that idea. You're a square peg fitting into the round hole. You don't fit. You're a misfit. This show in general, the the production style and everything is like that to me, like neither fish nor fowl. You know, it is one of these examples like we talked about a little bit with Parker Lewis or, you know, Malcolm in the Middle, where it's an early single camera half hour comedy, you know, it's it's a sitcom, but it, it really doesn't feel like one to me in any traditional sense. It's it's shot like a movie, but like a kind of crappy low budget movie from its time, the early 80s. As as you're easing into these first few scenes, and it's shot, like I said, single camera, in a real school, on location. There's no music or anything. The sound is like kind of echoey. And it does have this weird feel like you're watching a low budget movie from 1982, like the horror movies I like, Sleepaway Camp or something. Yeah. And and I would have been great with all of that. The thing that made it weird for me was they did a sort of far away, low, like pitched down, very bassy sounding kind of 
echoey laugh track. Oh yeah, and Let's it get was into that. so strange because it was it didn't need it. There was and and at first because the first time I noticed it was a scene in the cafeteria, yeah. and I thought that oh it's kids in the cafeteria just giggling, but then it just kept coming and it was this very bassy like not kids in the cafeteria sort of ha 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 and I was like what why is that still there? It was so distracting. This was the kind of compromise like cutting the baby in half because you can't decide who gets the baby. Like I could totally see the conversation where they're like, well, there, there's no studio audience for this. It's not really that kind of show. You know, should we have a laugh track? Maybe we shouldn't. And then the other argument being, well, it's a sitcom. It's funny. That's sort of the style. And so it's like the solution they come up with, just as you're saying, is this laugh track that's very subtle and low in the mix. And yes, the first scene takes place, long scene in the cafeteria where you have this general murmur. And so it isn't until later in the show when you start noticing it. And it's this bizarre, half-assed, like... Uh, like, I, I guess, like, we're, we're gonna have a laugh track a little bit so that you're not thrown off by the absence of it, but we don't want to distract you too much, so we won't have them laugh too hard. And it is, it, it's not like anything else I had ever heard. It's bizarre. That was one of the things. It was it, the, I think there was an AV Club article saying that at the time it was normal to have these laugh tracks, but this one sort of leaned heavy into it, doing it like, on every line in this weird way. And it's off-putting once you notice it's there. It's bizarre. But anyway, the, the premise of the show is pretty straightforward, right? It's Patty, that's Sarah Jessica Parker, and her friend Lauren. And they want to be popular, right? This is a lot like our first day of school episodes where it's like, what can we do to be cooler, to kind of fit in with the cool kids? And we get to meet... Uh, these, you know, sort of two or three like cool girls that they're like, we want to be friends with them. And these these older girls or more popular girls. Yeah, they're all freshmen, which I was like, OK, so we're only focused on freshman class kids here, except for the one love interest that, that's a senior. Yeah. And this is very much like you're sort of. High school 1.0, like they are unironically presenting these old tropes or archetypes, uh, specifically the sort of ditzy, you know, oh my God, what if I broke a nail, you know, that kind of girl. It's a pretty ungenerous portrayal, I would say, of these these other characters. Well, so what I thought is really interesting about this, okay, so this is the brainchild of this woman named Anne Beats, and she was a writer on SNL, like original SNL. And this is, you know, it's 1982, right, that this show comes on. So you got to think, what, SNL starting like 75, 76, something like that? So she's 34 years old. She is not too far away from being this young, hip woman herself and and knows about the, like, cliques and cliches and all the things, like the pop culture stuff that the kids are into, right? This is... Think about The Breakfast Club and the way that those stereotypes are portrayed there and all the John Hughes movies. Like, we're talking about the same kind of look, yeah. right? So that is, I mean, I see the the guy who's like the new wave guy. He's so Annie Potts and Pretty in Pink. You know what I mean? Like, every one of these tropes that we've gotten to know as like the 80s high school ex, that we got from John Hughes, this is like contemporary and even a like a predecessor to a lot yeah, of this John Hughes stuff. But yeah, it just struck me because we don't, at least in this episode, we do get the the new wave friends that they're very funny. Yeah, they're like, these two guys are like Lenny and Squiggy I from Laverne and exact, Shirley. No, yeah, they have their own Lenny and Squiggy. But uh, much, I, I like these guys better. I like the oh, yeah. new wave guy and the, the little comedian guy. They're, they're not as greasy and rapey as, <laughs> as Lenny well, and Squiggy. It's not the 50s or 60s or whatever. Yeah. So Patty and Lauren sit down at lunch with the cool girls, right. you know, this sort of, uh, I guess she's not a valley girl, but this this sort of vapid, popular girl. The talk of the town is Larry Simpson, right? All of these girls are like, Larry Simpson is a stone fox. But wait, did you recognize the cool girl? She is sitcom royalty. Tell me. because uh... Granddaughter of Ozzie and Harriet. 
daughter of Ricky Nelson. This is Tracy Nelson, who would go on to star with Tom Bosley in the Father Dowling Mysteries. Yes, okay. She is Sister Sister Frankie? Yeah, whatever. Some, Something like yeah, that. Yeah, she is the but young, she spunky nun. Is Exactly. In this, though, she's the popular girl with yeah. this horrible blonde wig, and she does this voice, you know, like, everything is like-like, you know? I just really like like him i have you know? to say though at first that's what i mean by uncharitable at first i was like this is kind of unfair because all these other characters are getting to be normal people and then they're making her such a caricature but i have to say the monologue that she delivers is amazing it's so great she's making fun of patty and lauren first of all i'm impressed that that these two have the the moxie to sit down next to the popular girls like i would never have done that in high school well and that is something that comes from this series right they are like unabashedly like they can't be kept down you know what i mean like they it's just like whatever they're gonna keep trying keep trucking and nothing it like nothing really gets to them lauren is the one who ha- is a little bit more of a social climber patty sjp's character is a little bit more like whatever i like me so i'm just gonna keep being me i hope people like me yeah but anyway when they're sitting together at lunch and they say something that the popular girl doesn't like. She, she says something about, like, don't make me sick. And she goes, I wouldn't want to puke all over your little lunchbox that your mom probably filled with all sorts of little baggies and stuff. Like, she just has this <laughs> disdain as she's, like, drawing out this weird little scenario for how your mom packed your lunchbox. But it's the whisper and, like, the sort of, you know, pauses, you know, that she, like takes you know it's so anyway i i adored it i was like i could watch this character for days this is so much fun it's um it reminded me of mean girls karen the uh amanda seyfried character Mm -hmm. in that she just the the pauses and yeah i really dug it yeah she kind of won me over but yeah so the story takes a bit of a weird turn because they're all drooling over Larry Simpson, right? He's the hottest guy in school. He's, you know, a senior, athlete, right? And then they go their separate ways, whatever. And Sarah Jessica Parker's on the stairway. Right. So she's been throwing out her lunch. She's been flushing her lunch for over a week. So no one will see her with her lunchbox because the girl made fun of her. So she hasn't been eating lunch. So she's walking up the stairs and she gets lightheaded and she sits down and like right in front of this Larry guy. Yeah. And this is where the sort of impressionistic style of the show is is a problem for me in terms of legibility of what's going on here. Because from the start... (laughs) I wrote the same thing. I was like, what is happening? I, I thought and still think, and I've watched this twice now, I am still not sure if this is a dream sequence. My conclusion is it's not. It's like a slightly impressionistic take on what happens. So Larry Simpson, the Stone Cold Fox, comes down, says, oh, are you okay or whatever? And is nice to her, basically. Oh, what's your name? What, you know, makes little jokes or whatever. Then they go to the diner, like, for milkshakes. And they're on a revolving set where they're sitting at a diner as though it's in a music video, a dream sequence type thing where the diner background is revolving around them. And you're going like... Okay, daydream. Uh, Any minute now, somebody's going to go, Patty, Patty, wake up. What's the answer? And that never happens. They're just staring into each other's eyes in this revolving diner set. They don't kiss or anything like that. It just goes to the next scene where Patty's going to her friend. Hey, guess what? I had milkshakes with Larry Simpson. Yep. That's I I was like, is this a fever dream? Did she pass out on the stairs? Is this even happening? Yes. Yes, it is. And they just did it in this very weird sort of beauty school dropout without the song kind of scene. Yeah. Yeah. And then he comes again because they're she's explaining this to her friends in gym class. So Larry Simpson comes by again and is like, oh, hey, Patty, how you doing? And he tells his his friend like, oh, this girl's crazy. You should hear her philosophy. You know, she's what got that such thing? an interesting mind. And again, he's just being nice to her. Yeah. And so we get this very sort of sitcom storyline. I don't know. This is one of the things where the confusion, like, 
I was genuinely confused right along with the character. Because yes. he basically says, are you going to the dance? I'll see you there. Well, she asks, um, no, Lauren asks if he's going to the dance so that it would give Patty a reason to have that conversation with him. And he's like, well, I wasn't going to, but maybe, maybe I will. Are you going to go? Just sort of like it was part of a conversation. Now, look, he's not a dummy. Like he kind of knows. And he also kind of likes, I think, that this little freshman girl that he thinks is cool is into him. But he also, we find out later, is dating a girl in college. So he's not actually interested in her. But the whole, you know, setup is meant to confuse you and let you the viewer think like Sarah Jessica Parker's character does that this might be a date. Right. And again, it's it's a casual date at best because sure. it's not like I'll pick you up at seven, let's wear matching corsages. He says, oh, cool, I'll see you there. But what happens, of course, is her friends immediately sort of bolster up this idea. They're like, oh, he said he'll see you there, right? So for all intents and purposes, you're basically married, you know, like they're right. they're encouraging her and, and supporting her, which I feel like is a common dynamic with these things when you're a kid, where your friends think they're helping you by encouraging you and sometimes they're not. No, they're giving you like wild delusions of grandeur. <laughs> exactly. So the two Lenny and Squiggy guys, they have kind of, they're also square pegs, right? And so they have kind of decided that they're into these two girls, our two main girls. And so they are in language class together with those old headphones. Do you remember those from grade school? Yeah. Oh, I love it. They had those like old fashioned headphones where it's like the earmuff part and and then there's like the wires and then that sort of padded piece that goes over your head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, so they're in language class and they all have their headphones on and they're practicing, you know, whatever language they're learning. And they all four of them take off their headphones and have this conversation over the little, you know, walls of the little partitions on their desks. And yeah, the the new wave guy who's like, what's his name? Johnny, Johnny Slash or yeah. something. He um, insists on multiple occasions that he's like, man, I'm not a punk. I'm new wave. Yeah. And that that got me thinking, you know, like I said, there's there's references to current music all over this and the actual appearance of the waitresses and he, he's doing the new wave thing. I feel like this show is saying like enough with the nostalgia, right? Like yes. our thing is like, let's be modern. Let's this be show, now now. <laughs> yeah. This show is going to be all about what's hip, what's cool. And like, yeah, we're going to Again, what Family Matters was trying to do by having Bobby Brown show up on their sitcom, you yeah. know, like we're we're tired of uh, celebrating the 60s and the 50s and we want to be we want to be hip, you know. Yeah. And you're going to have later on in the series, Bill Murray appearing as a wacky substitute teacher. Mm -hmm. So and he was like right there. I mean, stripes just came out, you know. Yeah. So so their deal is basically like. If the Larry Simpson thing falls through, then we'll hang out with you guys at the dance, basically. Right. And so we, we go to the dance, right? Like they're all kind of hanging out outside. So Lauren is insisting that Patty wait outside until Larry gets there so they can walk in together. Patty's like, no, you know, let's go inside. The guys that they came with, the little comedian guy and the new wave guy, they are waiting with them because they're like, they want to be their dates. So they're just hanging out. And so they see Larry like coming in from the parking lot. So all the friends scurry away and Patty just kind of hangs out. And then he like they go in and then he realizes pretty quickly. He's like, wait a minute. Were you waiting outside for me? Um, and she's like, no. Yes. Um and they and he's like, OK, look, and he comes clean like I'm seeing somebody, you know, but if I was going to see somebody else and she was going to be younger than me, it'd be you because like you're great, but it's not really a thing. And he gives her a kiss on the cheek and everybody sees it like the cool girl sees it. And they're all like, oh, I can't believe he kissed her. And then the Jamie Gertz character sees it and she's like, did he just kiss you? So, you know, it, it's a great little moment. And then the two our two main characters go dance with the two boys that brought them. Yeah. It occurs to me this has a very similar vibe as Carrie, which would have just come out a couple of years prior, but all about a dance. And that's got that 
that same thing of this older uh, hunky guy just sort of mysteriously taking an interest in this girl for no reason. And she has sort of against her better judgment. She's like, well, I, I, okay. But uh, yeah, this, this ending is very charming. I think you really feel that they're, they're, they're struggling to, to cram this into the half hour time slot because it's like, they're like, oh, okay, let's just dance. And immediately the credits start rolling. But you well, go- and the credits start rolling over the waitresses. Right, like because- we have a whole musical performance from yeah, the waitresses. Right. Like we've mentioned several times now, the waitresses are the band for the dance. And you kind of get the impression, oh, I bet they maybe did this kind of thing a lot on the show. Yeah, they had Devo on one episode. And again, it goes back to the show creators' connections through SNL with all like the hip, cool music people and everything. So, yeah. You know, it's funny because this so vastly predates the idea that the nerds are really the ones that are cool, right? Right. But you're starting to see the beginnings of that with the music stuff, with the idea that this Johnny Slash guy, you know, he's he's not a popular kid in school uh, and he dresses weird, but he knows he's into the good music and he goes to the city all the time and he knows where the cool clubs are and stuff. So it's starting to get into that idea that culturally you might be ahead of the game, even if you're one of the people that gets made fun of. Right, exactly. They had already kind of picked up on on that. And I think that just comes from who are the people that went on to be writers, you know, Mm -hmm. like if you were a writer on SNL, you weren't the coolest kid in school, particularly a woman, one of the only women in that writer's room that wasn't also on the on the show as a, you know, a, a character or a cast member. So the sad truth about Square Pegs is that it's a highly talented cast. It's mostly well written and it is well received by critics and charming right? Even in this very first episode, it didn't need to take long to find its legs, right? The only criticism we really had of it was that horrible laugh track, which is more a sign of the times than it is anything else. So behind the scenes, the whole production was kind of a shit show. Everybody was on drugs. Everybody was fucking everybody. Even the the, the kids especially. Okay. So Devo gave an interview after they were on the show and they were like, 15 and 16 year old girls were coming on to us. It was way too much. No one, there are no parents on that. So like no one's paying attention to what's happening to these kids. And years later, the showrunner, the show creator that Ann Betts is like, yeah, so what? There were drugs on sets. There's drugs on every set. So like no one was minding the welfare of the children. And All of the people in the cast, the whole main cast, are kids. And so, you know, anyway, that was really what TV Guide did a a, like a six part expose uh, article, a deep investigation on what happened with the Square Pegs cast and why. Yeah. And why that was. And it was just a couple years after it got canceled. And that's what they uncovered was that it was, you know, rampant with drugs and sex and things were weren't getting done. And it was crazy. And people were speaking on the condition of anonymity as well. A lot of the writers, you know, because it wasn't so far removed in this article from from when everything actually went down. All right. Well, so much for square pegs. Let's move on to the Jackie Thomas show. We're watching the pilots. This one is all about Tom Arnold, who at the time was married to Roseanne Arnold. And this show was directly following Roseanne. So the hope was that the audience who liked Roseanne so much would just stay Stick with it and keep watching this show, keep watching her husband, Tom Arnold, do his thing on on the show that's immediately following it. And they did a series of episodes that they called like a hot switch, meaning there was no commercial break or station ID or anything between the two shows. Hmm. So like one of the examples was at the end of an episode of Roseanne, the Connors sit down, turn on the TV and... And the Jackie Thomas show comes on. So it's like the transitions in Monty Python almost from one skit to the next. Exactly. Yeah, that's really funny. I remember this show. And I will say, you know, if you were watching TV in the 90s and the name The Jackie Thomas Show doesn't ring a bell, you still might remember this show. It is about 
Tom Arnold, but that's not exactly the the size of it because he's he plays the star of this show within the show. And what it's really about, kind of like 30 Rock or the Dick Van Dyke show, its biggest inspiration is the writer's room. Right. This is what is it like in the writer's room behind the scenes of, in this case, a TV sitcom. And interestingly, this came out the same year as the Larry Sanders show, which was what is it like behind the scenes of a talk show. And I, I just found that so interesting because this was 92. We had this little face off and spoiler alert, the Jackie Thomas show lost. You had the same exact thing 14 years later when 30 Rock and Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip <laughs> came out the same exact year. And those were literally the same premise, albeit very different tones. What is it like behind the scenes of SNL? And so it's just funny. This is something that crops up every now and then in the zeitgeist. People want to know what it's like to be a TV writer. But so the real star of this show is not Tom Arnold, but this actor who you might remember from the movie The Dream Team. And much later, he was in Better Call Saul as Kim Wexler's boss at the law firm. He's always playing professionals. He's always a straight man, and it's always his job to be the sort of competent, knowledgeable, down-to-earth guy who's a little sort of put upon. The Dream Team is one of my favorite movies from the 80s where Michael Keaton, Christopher Lloyd, Peter Boyle, and Alan First. That's right. He's the doctor in that. I yeah. couldn't... I was like, what do I know him from? And we had just watched The Dream Team not too long ago. That's, yeah. that's who he is. Yeah, they're all mental patients in this group therapy, and they go on this field trip that goes awry, and he plays their therapist, you know? And that, it's, that was always the way that they were using him. And so this is, I got to imagine, a pretty big break for this guy. He's the center of this show, you know, even though ostensibly it's all about this wacky Jackie Thomas character, he's really the protagonist. We meet him and begin the show on his first day at work. He meets his assistant and his fellow writers. And the pilot is all about how he's coming to realize that everybody is sort of quaking in fear you know, Devil Wears Prada style of this this crazy, tyrannical weirdo that they're all working for. Jackie Thomas, the eponymous star of this show that this main character, Jerry, has been hired to write. Right. And so the deal behind this, right? So Jackie Thomas, this is another like shout out, right? Because you had the Jackie Gleason show and you had the Danny Thomas show um, back years and years and years ago, right? The 60s and 50s and whatever. And so that was the Jackie and the Thomas. That's where that came from. So Tom Arnold is playing this like man-child baby star who is super insecure, uh, a total redneck, very, and like famous for, we don't know why, he's like a comedian in the vein of the, um, you know, are you smarter than a fifth grader redneck tour that those guys used right. to do. But also I'm thinking like Sam Kinison was a big deal in the 80s who I think he had already died maybe at this point, but uh, yeah, a wild man comedian. Yeah. And he's, he's just a, a mess. Like he's always in and out of rehab and he's a volatile personality. The, you know, they've had like nine head writers. Uh, they keep getting fired. Everyone on staff is terrified yeah, of him. You don't meet him until halfway through the episode. They do a good job of keeping him off camera and establishing this mystique about him. Right. And so that's the premise of the show is that this is an impossible place to work. And this guy who is the new head writer is going to, you know, hopefully be able to like bring this ragtag crew of people together. And we've got Brecken Meyer, who's like a day and a half before he goes and does Clueless, you know, floppy hair, skateboard, same look, same yeah, kid. Full on Jonathan Brandis, young 90s, oh, floppy hair. Jonathan Brandis. Man, you're just bringing back all those kids, all yeah, these things sorry. that were gone too soon. Yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, you know, we meet this whole cast of characters, several other writers, and then the cast of the show. And this is another thing that made me go, I bet that this was a costly show to make. You know, this is another one where we have 
Martin Mull is in it as a producer or something. From He's a network exec. But remember, this is produced by Roseanne Barr, like yeah. her production company. And at the time, that was like, you know, her and Tom producing it together. Oh, yeah. And he was in both shows. Yeah. I'm just saying it's a big ass cast is all I'm saying. You yeah. have this whole writer's room situation and then you have a whole cast of the show within the show and a handful of these people, you know, nobody's A-list celebrities, but you, you had some known quantities here. Well, you, you have some people that you would go on to know from other things, right? So the um, assistant character who is very much teeing up to be like a love interest, I think, for um, the main, our main head writer guy. She is from the John Larroquette show. So she went on later to star in the John Larroquette show. She also came back in Tom Arnold's next failed sitcom called Tom as his wife. Yeah, that's the premise. And so the storyline of this first episode, beyond just this main writer character, Jerry, being acclimated to his job, is that after we meet Brecken Meyer, who, like you said, is the young, hunky teenage son on the show and... Not hunky, but okay. But they think he is. And, uh, you know, he's starting to be on all the magazine covers and everything. And this would, of course, be playing into what was happening in real life. You know, this since, since the 70s, at least, you know, if you have a family sitcom, the teenage kids are going to end up with their own sort of mini celebrity that only they can have. And Jackie Thomas, Tom Arnold, doesn't like that. And so when he finally gets to meet this head writer about halfway through the episode, he He's like, great, welcome aboard. Your first assignment, you have to kill off this snot-nosed kid that's playing my kid on the show. I want him to die in a fiery car accident in the next episode. Cancel the read-through until you make that rewrite and make that happen. Right, and you have to do that because he's getting more fan mail than me. Yeah, exactly. He's on all the magazine covers. He's more... This is straight up sitcom jealousy. And I want to say here, because one thing we haven't mentioned about this show, the same way that Square Pegs had a little bit of like a hip snooty attitude about music, this does about TV sitcoms, yes. right? They make a point to drop the names of Taxi and... Cheers. And Cheers and Barney Miller. Yep. Uh, they're, they're trying to say that this writer guy has a pedigree that he's worked on good sitcoms. And, and they make fun of one of the other women in the writer's room because her like claim to fame is that she wrote on The Brady Bunch. Right. They're throwing shade at Brady Bunch. They have one of his writers is like this lady who's a little bit older, or just generally kind of square. And it's supposed to be like, yeah, her thing is she's cheesy because she wrote on The Brady Bunch. And then later on when he meets Tom Arnold, we throw shade at Green Acres. He asks him, you know, what's your idea of a good show? Oh, I like that pig on Green Acres. So this is very much trying to sort of throw down the gauntlet of like, hey, look, there are good sitcoms and bad sitcoms. And, you know, again, this is like High Fidelity, the movie, but of sitcoms, you know, it's like if you want to be hip, you know, you're watching Cheers, you're watching Taxi, you're not watching Green Acres, you're not watching Mr. Ed, get that shit out of here. You know, it's, <laughs> it's trying to... Well, and so, and then you've got the network executive who is talking about how Brecken Meyer's character is going to get his own show. He's going to be spun off in a couple of seasons. Right. So make sure you write more for him because he's an awful lot like that guy, Michael J. And then um, we've got Paul Feig in this as well. He's a writer in the writer's room, but this was like before he... Yeah. Paul know, Feig is the creator of Freaks and Geeks and the director of Bridesmaids and all of the good Melissa McCarthy movies. Um, and he's a major producer and director now. But yeah, he's an actor in this. But my point about bringing up the snootiness with the sitcoms is just to say that once we actually get down to this story, this is a very tropey sitcom-y story that you'd be more likely to find on the sitcoms that they're making fun of than you would ever find on Cheers or Taxi. Well, and that's why I kind of took that as more of like a meta thing, right? Like Roseanne and Tom Arnold, they are bread and butter in the, you know, working class blue collar kind of humor. So yeah. why wouldn't they think that 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 was an okay pedigree to go on and do comedy? Yeah, well, but I think that it's an interesting contrast because yes, Roseanne is 
you know, working class through and through. But I think she would argue I'm working class like Archie Bunker was working class. Well, like and my show is a quality, prestigious, respectable working class show. Yeah, it's a Norman Lear show. But yeah, so that's the dilemma going into act three of this is what am I going to do? I'm the head writer and I've got the the you know, effectively the boss, the guy that's in charge wants me to kill off this character. And so the assistant who, like you said, seems like we're getting ready for a will they won't they type thing. If this were to continue, she gets in a line there about like, you got to get in touch with your feminine side, you know, your brain. And then it randomly gets this sort of condescending applause break, like, ah, yeah, women, feminism, yay. But yeah, it was the four women in the audience clapping for that. (laughs) She's sort of being presented as like, she's the with the ideas, right? Like she's the one that's been here as all these writers have come and gone. And presumably because of the inherent sexism of the television industry, she is never considered to actually take on a job like that. But she has the experience and the insight. Exactly. She's been able to survive the crazy, toxic work environment. And, you know, sort of is the only one who has any insight. And so then we get this cute little scene of like, so are you going to give me some of that insight? So the last head writer got fired because Jackie Thomas had asked him to write his mother or his cousin, this woman, into an episode, right? And the head writer didn't want to do it, was like, no, you know, she's not an actor. I'm not writing this random person just because she's your family member into this episode. And so he got fired. Well, the assistant is like, all he had to do, all he would have had to do is write her in and give her better jokes than Jackie. And Jackie would have fired her himself. Right, exactly. So what she's saying is that (laughs) I don't necessarily have a particular solution for you. But what you have to try is don't appeal to Jackie's logic or reason appeal to his vanity, right? He will defend his status and his celebrity at all costs. He will do what makes himself look good. And so we get a cut to the next day where Jerry, our main writer, comes in and he does... Jackie is extremely susceptible to reverse psychology. Jerry does the most transparent, like... Yeah, I've got this idea for you, but nah, you wouldn't be interested. Ah, you wouldn't want to hear it, you know. But of course, Jackie's like, no, no, tell me. And so he basically pitches him on this idea of what if your son was in a car accident, but instead of being killed, his kidneys were damaged and he needed a kidney transplant. You have two kidneys, but only one of them is a high quality kidney. So you choose to donate your one fully functional kidney to your son and then you'll look like a hero. But nah, you wouldn't want to do that. And so, of course, Jackie's like, hell yes. His only concern is what if I need my other kidney? And he has to point out, don't worry, it's a fictitious kidney. That's right. This is a showbiz kidney. I'm never going to put you in a situation where that's going to be a problem, which to me sounds like foreshadowing because I would very shortly put him in a situation (laughs) where that kidney became a problem. But the whole point of this is that this is supposed to be a comedy show and none of this is a comedy show scene like this is all out of some weird soap opera so they're doing a very special episode of the jackie thomas show and we see at the end you know you get little snippets you got to imagine this was always the case on a show like this you never get to really see much of the show within the show you get little snippets of it So we get a little taste and then Jackie Thomas is going up to the studio audience and just basking in their adoration. Like, guys, you like me more, right? Because I donated my kidney. Oh, my God. Don't worry. It's not real. It was so not only was it cringe from like that because it was written as cringe, but it was also just bad. And reviewers, critics and all, that's what they had to say about this show. It was like, we don't need Tom Arnold in this show. The writers do a good job of setting him up as this horrible tyrant and like man child the show is worse when he's on screen it's better when we just talk about him and so if he had you know 12 seconds of screen time in every episode that would be the best use of his character and i wholeheartedly agree because the show is better when he's not there now i will say there was a nice snappy dialogue scene between the when he, the ver- his very first introduction scene when he's lifting weights and the the head writer comes in 
that that the snappy dialogue was there. I love a good like everybody's picking up their cues, quick, 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 quick kind of conversation. That was good. But other than that, he is superfluous to this show. Well, it's funny. I kind of feel the same way, but I think to me it's more of a glass half full thing where I'm admiring the restraint of if you're Tom and Roseanne Arnold and you're building a new sitcom around Tom Arnold, I admire that they didn't say okay, family sitcom and he's the dad or workplace sitcom and he's the boss. I mean, they sort of did. But they said, no, we're going to have a show that's about him ostensibly. But I feel like he had the self-awareness to recognize people don't necessarily want to see me for 22 minutes on stage. And we actually get this very down-to-earth, reasonable guy and kind of like much more tolerable people for most of it. And he, even though he's the name on the show is actually used, again, more than 12 seconds, but sparingly. Yes, you're you're right. And he did have the self-awareness to say he didn't feel like he was ready to be the lead of a sitcom. This was always meant to be an ensemble show. But I think as time goes on, he is used more and they should continue to show the amount of restraint that you're giving them credit for in this episode. The other thing is, is that all of the critics, so now we're going to get into some of that backstage drama, right? So all of the critics, um, well, not all, but three reviewers that had bad things to say about the pilot episode received scathing letters from Roseanne Arnold herself that next week that, of course, for like whatever, 1994 or something, went as viral as they did. She called one of them the F word. And then was like, but it's just because I know him personally and he actually is gay. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know that that makes it better. Yeah. So um, and neither of them, like neither Tom nor Roseanne apologized for that. They were like, yeah, well, you know, critics, they have things to say and we have things to say to them. And so and Roseanne's whole thing was, you know, by saying by giving Tom bad reviews, you're taking money out of my pocket and his pocket. And that's not okay. So, of course, I'm going to send you a nasty letter. So that was that. Then also kind of going along around the same time, there was a documentary film crew over at the Roseanne show filming a documentary about their like Santa Claus episode so they are um they have this documentary thing that was going on over there and what comes out of this documentary is that the way Roseanne the show is run by Roseanne is shockingly similar to what they're portraying Jackie as in the way that the Jackie Thomas show is being run in its fictional universe. That is wild, though, because it is, you know, (laughs) it is just so clearly portrayed in a negative light. And so either it means that they are self-aware and they're just like, ha ha, isn't it funny how horrible we are? Or her sitcom is uh, like embraces her foibles in in all of these obvious ways, but also is very like compassionate and like grounded and well rounded. It just it, it's just so different, you know. I just sure, but there were apparently behind the scenes like she ran that like a diva. They were they went through. I mean, people were scared to talk to her. They went through writers like tissues and that is what you know and that when you say the word diva that almost kind of makes a click to me like what if i bet maybe she sees this as like a fun exaggeration you know like oh i bet this is what people think of me or like maybe this like let me exaggerate it to a comic extent what people might say about me or something and not not getting maybe like how on the nose it is or how that it's not as much of an exaggeration as they think i don't All right, let's move on to The Class. Oh, this is one of these shows I watched. I think I TiVo'd it. It was teed up to be the next big thing. You had so many people in this cast. It was hilarious. It was on around the same time as How I Met Your Mother. I think How I Met Your Mother premiered the season before. And then this is a, it was on CBS starring Lizzie frickin' Kaplan, okay, who 
If you knew anything, you might know her from Mean Girls, but she was not Lizzie Kaplan as we know her today, right? This was like her major thing. It had John Ritter's son, right? What's his name? Jason, um, Ritter. Jason Ritter. The show creators are David Crane from Friends and Jeffrey Cleric from Mad About You. And the director is none other than James Burroughs. We had Jesse Tyler Ferguson ripped from the Broadway stage, having been nominated for a Tony for 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. He's hilarious. He's the guy who's the redhead guy in Modern Family. In Modern Family. And then you've got Andrea Anders, who will go on to um, be in Joey after this gets canceled. It John Bernthal from The Walking Dead. Yes, who I didn't watch The Walking Dead, but another one. So like everyone in this show is about to be famous. You have Lucy Punch, who is a hilarious, blonde, tall, gorgeous um, comedy actress. And she was in New Girl for a while as the like hippy dippy boss of that like little sunshiny school. She's been in a ton of stuff. So this show is great. And the premise is... The premise is Stephen King's It but with a birthday party instead of an evil clown. That Wait was a minute, my what? Note. Say that again. Why? The story of It is all about this group of friends who are kids and make this promise to all get back together, you know, 30 years later. So we reunite with them when they're all in their re- respective careers and sort of rekindle all these little friendships and romances and stuff. Just the whole vibe of it as they were going through one by one and like catching you up on this is what this person's up to. This is what that person's up to. It, I'm mean, like, this is just like it, but without Pennywise. I was going to say, but didn't, wasn't the reason they decided to all meet up together again in 30 years was because they had this like crazy childhood trauma that they shared. Yeah. And this time it's to throw a birthday party. No, no. This time it's because Jason Ritter is a love bomber. He's one of these boyfriends that is like just too much. And he, at some medical conference, met this girl that, surprise, he had gone to third grade with. Now they've been together like three years or something or four years. They're engaged or they're about to be engaged or whatever. And he wants to throw her this amazing birthday party on the anniversary of the day they met, which is the anniversary of their first gr- or their third grade class. And so he invites everybody from their third grade class that he can find, that he can track down to a birthday party reunion where she promptly breaks up with him for being a love bomber and we get to meet all this great little cast of characters. So I came to the show not knowing any of these people, right? Like I'd heard of Jason Ritter because of his dad, but I don't remember anything he was in before this. I did know about Jesse Tyler Ferguson, but I didn't realize it was him because I'd only ever heard the album of Spelling Bee, I hadn't actually ever seen it. So I didn't know who he was, right? And Lizzie Kaplan, it was like a blip. I didn't even recognize her as the same girl that was from Mean Girls. Let's talk about Lizzie Kaplan for a second, because I feel like by the time she's done, she's going to have one of the best careers of any actors, I think, of our generation. You know, she's one of those people that flies a little bit under the radar, but then when you look at the stuff she's in, like she's just been in all these amazing movies and TV shows, you know, that, that masters and masters sex show with, with her and Michael Sheen, um, you know, just all the interesting movies. She's played Annie Wilkes now on the TV version of, of the Stephen King thing. Like that she's done all of these interesting shows and movies and roles and stuff and I feel like she's somebody that that really chooses what she does I don't know just like based on interest and not like money and just like she's she's just had a really solid career so far is is what I'm saying absolutely her character in this she's the first one we meet I think in this series of phone calls you know besides Jason Ritter and her character is very broadly drawn She begins every sentence with, I normally hate everybody, but, 
And then it's either followed by, but I hate you even more, or like something like that. We meet her, I think, developing photos in a dark room, maybe. She's yes. got the gothy makeup on. Oh, it's early aughts, man. She's got the spiky hair. I yeah. had spiky hair then, too. The, her hair's a little bit of a bummer. As somebody that finds her a really, you know, appealing lady, this is not a good look for her. But yeah, like you said... Um, but at least it isn't the short mini bangs that she had for a while. <laughs> so the casting of her is is a obvious move after Mean Girls. Like, it's it's the same deal, and that's fine. But yeah, like... You know, you were talking about the amazing people behind the scenes on this show. If if we're trying to make this be one of the shows that the characters on the last show would be lionizing as one of the good ones and not making fun of as one of the cheesy ones, the way that she's characterized, I'm immediately starting to go like, I don't know, this is a little much. You know? It doesn't stay here. So she, I mean, I don't know, I'm sure you could probably tell already, but there is going to be a will they won't they thing with her and Jason Ritter. And so it kind of immediately she gets this like the, you know, the, the hard shell is cracked in a way that is, it makes her more dynamic and less one dimensional. But yeah, in the pilot, you're right there. It is very much a like Janice Dean characterization. What I walked away from this show with was, dude, that redheaded guy is really funny. And that as well builds over the next couple episodes. I just, like I said, when I first came to the show, knew the name, but didn't put name to face because I'd only ever heard the album. I He is brilliant. So we're talking about Richie now. So yeah. why don't we back up and explain what his story is. Okay, so his story is he is about to kill himself. He is like a, in the process of taking a handful of pills when he gets the call to come to this third grade reunion I know it's weird, but you, you know, come anyway. And he just says yes and decides to go and puts off killing himself for another day. And while at the party, he meets Kat's sister. Kat is played by Lizzie Kaplan. Kat's sister, Lena, who's played by an actress I don't recognize. No, she um, looks a lot like Bjork. No, she does kind of look like Bjork. But anyway, so Lena, and she's also this like quirky girl who's like in love with love. She is like a manic pixie dream girl that isn't put there to make a man's life better. Yeah, it's not like, that manic, but still a pixie dream girl. Yeah, for sure. And she's a little weird and she is she kind of talks like this a little, has this weird sort of voice. And um, yeah, and so they meet at the party or reconnect at the party because they knew each other in third grade. But Lizzie Kaplan and her both left that school after third grade and so didn't go through school with the rest of the some of those kids. Whereas you've got... Andre Anders' character and the guy from Walking Dead, their characters stayed at that school right. and then all throughout high school were right. together and they're, dated. Yeah, they're townies. And it's just so funny. John Bernthal, yeah, like he was knocking around for a long time before he got that role on The Walking Dead. And they always use him. He'll be in little parts here or there, just one scene. But... You know, he's he's this guy like he's handsome, but he has this edge to him like he's he's a little scary. And so you don't have him play your Larry Simpsons of the world. You always have him if it's a character that's going to have a little spark of violence or right. a spark well, of passion. Right, because he looks like he's had his nose broken several yeah. times. Yeah, he's a guy that's been in a fight and he's yeah. he has that intensity to him. And so when he got that role on The Walking Dead, it was finally like, okay, now he's like he's off to the races and he was the Punisher and the Marvel Netflix stuff. And he's, you know, now everybody knows who he is. But yeah, you could see this as one of those roles where he's inching his way there. He's basically, you know, he lives at home with his mom. He's got a similar relationship to his mom as... Howard in yes. Big Bang Theory, yes. the explosive anger, the mom, what are you doing? So hold on to that thought, because I every time I watch Big Bang Theory, it would remind me of this. This show, as we know, because it's on our, you know, one season wonders was canceled after one season. It was on CBS in the eight o'clock time slot. Who do you think it got replaced with? The Big Bang Theory. Oh, wow. I didn't realize those were so close 
time wise. Yes. Yeah. So so he's living with his mom and his relationship ends. He has a breakup at the beginning. Like, what's his story? So his story is that he is just kind of like stuck in life. He's living with his mom. He talks about like his best days being years ago. They, they're they all supposed to be in their late 20s. And he talks about his best days being in high school because he and the girl played by Andrea Anders broke up shortly after high school. So he's he's an Al Bundy in the making. Yeah, I have to say, I like the idea of this party as the hub for all these different scenarios and that you have all these different characters coming in. And I don't know, I just I think that's a good hook. What I will say is that to me, there's something about this show. And I think this is where maybe you and I differ on it. Having just seen the pilot and giving that all of the sort of, you know, latitude that that we have to, it doesn't surprise me that this show didn't last. There's just something about this that there's a feeling like kissing my sister or something. There's a feeling of like, it doesn't totally gel. And I think it maybe has to do with the time that it's coming and the sensibilities of the people making it that, This is a point where these multi-camera sitcoms like are just they're they're starting to be out of vogue and they're starting to get replaced by stuff like The Office and 30 Rock and the newer sensibilities, uh, you know, whether it's the single camera stuff, the mockumentary, whatever. And it's like and and. Even beyond that, like the sensibility, the sense of humor is changing. And so I see that in the broadness of the characters and the jokes, like there's something about it where I can tell by what everything looks like, that this is pretty recent, that this is not that old. And yet it doesn't have like the humor isn't connecting the way a 30 Rock or a Shit's Creek or a New Girl would, you know? it's It just feels a little like your dad's sitcom. Your dad's sitcom, but meant for people that were our age. Yeah. Right? Because they, like I said, this I think was like 2006 or something, 2005 and or seven in that area. They very much are our age. You know, they're at, like we were in our late 20s, mid to late 20s at the time. They're supposed to be in their mid to late 20s. The, the weekly Link in this cast, I think, is Jason Ritter. Yes. And that's what's unfortunate, right? Because he is supposed to be the one. He's the Rachel. And they went way out of their way to say that this was not another Friends because none of these people really even know each other. They haven't been in touch for 20 years. Like, that's their whole shtick with this show. But it was supposed to be another ensemble comedy where we have this sort of group of people that has like sort of loosely related lives and are somehow going to yeah, end up being interconnected. That, if you think that's a substantial difference, then you don't understand the appeal of Friends. Right. You know, but it go, was this the, is nothing alike. The creator of Friends is trying to distance himself with his new show from his old show. Sure. So that, I mean, I get what they were trying to say there, right? But the fact of the matter is that Jason Ritter is supposed to be your Rachel. And he doesn't have any of the charisma of Jennifer Aniston. But thankfully, you've got all these other wonderful characters around him that are going to lift it up. And he is made better in the later episodes because his the will they won't they thing with Lizzie Kaplan is so great. You know what I mean? Like he is able to have his acting chop shine a little bit more because she's a wonderful scene partner. And there's just a lot of great things that we have going on right so at the the party this um relationship between the guy from the walking dead and andrea anders is like rekindled because she's gone on to marry some hall of famer football guy who's older than right. her dad yeah. and she's super unhappy in the marriage and so now we've got the drama of like a, an affair beginning because she at the end of the night leaves her husband at home and goes to have a a night with her ex-boyfriend who is this guy from the walking dead and jesse tyler ferguson and the character lena they go on their first date and they are perfectly quirky and weird together and so that we've got that going on well that was one of my notes for this show was that it would be nice if one of these stories wasn't a romance i thought like All of these combinations of characters and all these things going on, every one of them is 
a romance of people getting together. And I just thought, like, just mix it up a little. Have one be yeah, something else. They're doing a business. I don't know. Just just something so that it's not all a series of scenes of people almost kissing or whatever. Just mix it up. No, and I think you're right. And I think what's happening is they're trying to see what sticks, yeah. right? They're trying to figure out which one of these is going to be the go-to couple and how are we going to make that happen? I don't know. This is one... The more I'm thinking about the story, the more like I, I start to sour on it. Like I'm just thinking how this Jesse Tyler Ferguson character, you know, it's basically like Ross, but you take the sadness and just like turn it way up, you oh, know? Like, you're just picking it apart because you didn't get to know him. Well, you just think of how if friends began with Ross being like, oh, I'm so bummed out because it turned out that my wife is a lesbian. And now this one is like, this guy is committing suicide in the first scene. It's just like, wow, they're really taking the note that people love sad sex. Again, it's all played. I think you're taking it way too seriously. It's all played for comedy. It, look, oh, it's but so was Ross. Like, please just watch more episodes and stop being a grouch because it really look. You get to see all of the. You know how I am about actors, right? Like, you get to see all of their talent shine. Everybody gets great moments. The writing is funny. It is a wonderful little show. It was nominated for a friggin' Emmy. That surprises me. It was like, that's what I'm saying. It <laughs> well, is a good show. But it also could be like the pedigree, you know, it could sort of be like, oh, James Burroughs and the Marta Kaufman are like it automatically. Has well, it wasn't this, Marta or, Kaufman. It was David other, Crane. Yeah. yeah. Also, like you said, because there are so many characters, the story of this first episode is very much, and this isn't a criticism, but it is just like, Here's let's just kick in motion the Everybody. the show. Right. right. So it's like meet every character one by one, come together at the party, and then the guy gets broken up with at the party, and then everyone goes their separate ways. And it's 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 fun, but it's it's not like the Jackie Thomas one where it's like, here's the little conflict we have to solve. No. It's more just like meet everybody and get a sense of like what we're in store for. Right. And I really feel like you have to watch a couple of the episodes, you know, watch one through three before you're like, OK, cool, which, you know, I mean, to be honest, that's probably their downfall. So if we're tracking the ratings, right. Square pegs, what did we say? That was 24. Uh Uh, Jackie Thomas averaged a 15 share. This, 10 years later, averaging an 8. So it stands to reason that they'll go down. I just, it's interesting to me how much, right? Like we're looking at 10 points every decade. So was that the reason why this is canceled? This, uh, you know... Budget, because it was huge. And like we talked about in the beginning, they did end up like midway through slashing some writers and getting rid of Lucy Punch, which is a bummer. And then they didn't officially not renew until the upfronts for the new season where the Big Bang Theory was announced in its time slot. So everybody found out right as the upfronts were being announced and took to their MySpaces because it was 2006 yeah. and, uh, you know, wrote little messages about how sad they were to not be able to, you know, be part of the CBS family the next year. But almost everybody went on to have pretty strong careers, as we've mentioned. Everybody had these like amazing high hopes, like the president of CBS sat in on their very first table read. Like that's Mm -hmm. what a big deal this was. They gave them an eight o'clock time slot on some like prime night. I don't even remember what night it is now, but they, you know, it was like too much hype, too much. Oh, this is just going to be good. And so the expectations were that much higher for it, even though if they had just let it be the little show that could with all these new people, it probably would have done better. But in the long run, they made the right call. Like replacing this with the Big Bang Theory that went then went on to run for like 12 years as a multicam sitcom and blew all expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think there's something to be said for that. Like I think... When you think about it, yeah, many of these people went on to have these amazing careers. Like I argued Lizzie Kaplan, I think, has has one of the most amazing careers of anybody, any working actor now. Jim Parsons, 
He's he's doing fine, but I wouldn't necessarily say he had an amazing post-sitcom career. I think there's something about what happens on some of these shows, this, this particular magic with a certain character or a certain combination of people that is just this, like, spark that just can't be predicted by, well, the talent that we put into it and the pedigree and everything. And so, yeah, you know, of course, watching this one episode is not enough for me to really have, you know, any kind of a real opinion about it. But I could see this, despite all of these great people being involved, just not igniting the way that Sheldon and the gang on Big Bang Theory did, even though nobody could have known that those guys, you know, were, would end up having the more successful show than this one. Yeah. So... Speaking of, right, the amazing cast and the amazing pedigree, um, and maybe they're not just being the magic spark and that being the thing that killed it. Well, so the next show we're going to talk about has the amazing cast, amazing pedigree, and the magic spark, yet still canceled. All right. Well, let's, let's start talking about Trophy Wife. So you said it right there. Trophy Wife. That is the reason... This show didn't make it. Explain. People were not interested in watching a show called The Trophy Wife. It's a sitcom. It's very much a woman, like a like a, a women's story. And so this is not a sitcom where the marketing or anything is aimed at men. Like this is definitely a, a show for women. And women don't want to watch a show about a trophy wife. So the marketing failed despite all of the amazingness. The Trophy Wife, you have Bradley Whitford and his three wives, two exes, one current. First wife, Marsha frickin' Gay Harden. Yeah. Second wife, the baddie and daffy, Michaela Watkins, and his new wife, who is the Trophy Wife in quotes, because this whole series is about her not being actually a trophy wife even though she's young and sexy and blonde and leggy right yeah. so she looks like that but she actually isn't that and that's what the whole series is about but it's completely missed because shitty marketing she's played by malin ackerman fabulous cast fabulous writing hilarious like pilot episode you can't go wrong what are your thoughts I don't know. I find Malin Ackerman is a very... I've never been able to totally get a handle on her. She first showed up for me in the Watchmen movie. Right. And uh, there were a lot of recognizable people in that movie. I didn't know who she was. And she's one of these people... Jessica Alba was like this for a while, where they're very striking looking, obviously. And that's part of their whole deal is that they're, you know, they're these really sexy young women, but they they make a point to be in these comedies, these raunchy comedies or silly comedies, you know, so Malin Ackerman likes to work with David Wayne. She's in the Wet Hot American Summer thing, and she pops up in Ben Stiller movies and stuff. And I still never... I don't know if they don't, like, give her a lot to do in those things. Like, in all of those things, I've still never really formed any, an opinion about her. So she's one of these people, like, all I really have is, like I said, this this very striking-looking woman who seems to show up in a lot of stuff, but kind of, like maybe through no fault of her own, doesn't like really make an impression. But what I would say is, I don't really remember this show coming out. Oh, but, I definitely don't. I'd never heard of it before. But when I saw the cast, I was like, well, we got to watch this one. Well, that's the thing. I might have felt that way about Bradley Whitford. And I, you know, I certainly like Michaela Watkins and, and Marsha Gay Harden. But I would not have been excited about seeing Malin Ackerman's face on a billboard and, and seeing that there was a sitcom built around her. So to me, Malin Ackerman is Cameron Diaz, who didn't have as good of management. 
Well, I guess that's the question. I think Cameron Diaz is an excellent example. Like, she's one that did those movies. She came on the scene famous for being super hot and then did all the raunchy comedies and really showed, like, oh, yeah, she got it. Like, you're not going to watch there's something about Mary and go like, ah, oh, gee, I don't know. She's, she's hot, but can she, can she really do it? Like, no, Cameron Diaz nails it. Malin Ackerman, again, like, I don't know. She, I never had the thought that she was bad, but that just doesn't happen when I watch her movies. She doesn't get to the, like, she doesn't hit it as hard as Cameron Diaz is what you're saying. Or maybe she's just not given the good stuff. Like, well, she just I mean, that's what I'm saying. Management, then she's not either picking the right things or, but so I think, at least in this, and I've only seen the one episode, right? So I'm going to drop my I lived in Europe during the 2015 television season. So of course I didn't see this. Oh, I was living in Europe. Um, but <laughs> She was big in Sweden. I she, <laughs> she was big in Sweden. No, so I had never heard of this show. And when I saw the cast, I was like, oh, this is cool. But you're right. It was Bradley Whit- Whitford and Marsha Gay Harden who drew me to it. And then I saw, oh, the trophy wife is Malin Ackerman. Well, that's spot on because that's what she always ends up having to play. So that's going to be funny in a sitcom. Whereas in a movie, I think you're right. Sometimes in a bigger story, it's going to get lost here or there. You know, you, you don't necessarily have enough stuff when you're just stuck in this trope. Okay, fine. Maybe she'll have a little bit more here. And turns out she's the lead. I thought she did a pretty good job. I thought, again, in the pilot, she's funny. Her best friend in this is Natalie Morales. So we get a little like, you know, they're party girls. The premise of the show, they're party girls. They're out one night drinking and doing karaoke, being silly, dancing on tables. She literally falls in Bradley Whitford's lap, breaks his nose with her elbow. They go to the hospital and like while in the hospital, His ex-wife is the doctor who sets his nose. His other ex-wife shows up with the kids because she was bringing them there to meet with him because he had been out at like a work dinner that had turned into drinks with clients. And that's why they were at the karaoke bar. And so thus begins their relationship. They have a meet cute. And so she goes from being this party girl to a year later. Now she's married and she's got three kids with an older man and two women that are his ex-wives that are very different people in her life. Yeah. And the thrust of the show, it seems, at least this episode, is she's she's trying to win over the kids, basically, right? The kids don't like her. There's a daughter who, uh, you know, you can tell right away that this is going to come back to haunt her later. She's trying to connect with the daughter and says something, you know, I guess she's going to a a concert or a party or something. And she says, oh, we used to, uh, you know, we used to sneak vodka around in Poland spring bottles or in in water bottles. And, you know, obviously the kid is going to take that as a as a pro tip. But uh, yeah, she's trying to bond with the kids. The daughter says, no one expects you to be a mom. Just think of yourself as my dad's third wife. Right. And I don't know, that's kind of, you know, she wants to be trusted to take the kids to school, right? Like, that's the gist of the story, right? Yeah, she's just trying to, like, fit in and um, be helpful, right? You know, I think he is some high-powered attorney, and his first wife is this, you know, neurosurgeon or something, and the second wife is Michaela Watkins, and she's this, like, Reiki healer, yoga teacher, kind of batty daffy, and there's a lot of fun comedy with, I guess, she has a -a hide-a-key at the house and so then Bradley Whitford at the end buys like 70 hide keys and puts them all around and so then she's like doing this whole bit in the yard shaking every key or shaking every rock being like I'll just feel the vibrations and it's really fun so we we get really great moments of comedy there you have Marsha Gay Harden is very much like no nonsense not putting up with any of the bullshit of her ridiculous ex-husband and his crazy wives that he that he keeps marrying and is doing what she can to kind of hold it together for her twins cuz the two the the two oldest kids are twins and they're in high school like you know they're around 15 16 or whatever 
And so she is power mom. She's like, I have gone it alone for many, many years. I take care of my kids. I don't need a man. I don't need all of you people. I, I don't need any of this. And all of you are just in my way. And especially you, new third wife, right. who is just as crazy as these kids. You're yeah, their age, basically. Right. She obviously, like most ex-wives in these situations, sort of finds the whole thing distasteful and like you should not exist in this context to begin with. Now, what's the custody situation here? The kids live with both parents? Yeah. So he has the twins with his first wife and he has the adopted son from China with his second wife. And so they have kind of half the time. And so he says to her at one point um, during the like meet cute scene, do you want to go out on a date? I'm free, you know, Tuesdays, Thursdays right. and every, every other, other weekend Saturday, or yeah. something. Yeah. So it's like he he's worked it out with both wives or ex-wives so that they have the kids, you know, the majority of the time and that his days are not now alternating. So he has all three of his kids at the same time during Thursdays and every other weekend or right. something. And I think that's important because the dynamic that it's trying to establish, I think, is like this woman's coming in. So she's, you know, theoretically their stepmom, but they're old enough that like none of these kids need to be cared for in the way that little kids do. And so their biological mothers, these two ex-wives, actually one of them's not biological, but these two ex-wives are kind of like, you know, th don't worry about this. Like you want to date our husband or be married to our ex-husband. That's fine. These are our kids. They're, you know, they're teenagers. So like, you shouldn't have to deal with this. Leave it to me. But the reality is they're at an age where they have lots and lots of issues that they need to deal with. But their issues are things like the son is writing Poseidon porn. And they <laughs> think that it's about Mylon Ackerman. So I feel like that's, that's the sort of heart of the premise of this show, I think is that, you know, this quote unquote trophy wife has these stepkids that are old enough that the assumption is she shouldn't really be bothered with them. But the reality is she can actually maybe help them more than anyone, maybe kind of like the nanny. Yeah, well, and I think that's you're kind of hitting it right on there, right? That she is trying to find her way into this different type of modern family, right? Like the the story of this show is that if it had been, it was on ABC. So if it had been the follow up to modern family, a moderner family, yeah. then it would have been great. If it got the time slot coming right after that, that would have been the right audience for it. People would have gotten it. It was very funny. And, you know, it, it could have done more, but it didn't. It had the shitty marketing and it also apparently had a crappy time slot too. So it just wasn't given a, a good shot. But yeah, so it, it's her trying to find her way in this crazy, wacky co-parenting situation that works so far. Right. And the whole transportation thing is going to be sort of a story point here, right? right? Because the whole sort of final act of this revolves around uh, Malin Ackerman's character wants the, you know, privilege slash responsibility of taking the kids home from school, right? She wants to be trusted with that. And this is all the same day that she's given the daughter the helpful tip about sneaking around the vodka in the water bottle. Right. So there's apparently a last minute call from the teacher played by Phyllis from the office, yeah. um, the son's teacher at the high school, that they need to come in for a, a parent meeting and none of the parents can make it. The dad has a trial, the, you know, the mom has a surgery. And so Malin Ackerman's like, I can go. It's fine. I'll take notes. I'll fill you guys in. It's no big deal. I'll be the one to go to the parent meeting. So she goes and she's all excited and gets out her little notebook. And, the, you know, there's the awkward scene between Phyllis and Malin Ackerman about like, oh, you look like you could be a student here, you know. And then Marsha Gay Harden shows up. And she looks at wife number three, like, what the hell are you doing here? Where is 
the father and she's like oh you know he's got this deposition or whatever he's got this trial or something so he can't and she's like well I canceled surgery so he could and then you immediately see Phyllis from the office like her whole demeanor changes she's got all this deference she's like oh hello doctor so and so it's so good thank you for coming at last minute notice and yeah. blah 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 and so then tells them about the Poseidon porn and they see the ankle tattoo so he's mentioned an ankle tattoo in the porn in his erotica that he's writing and they notice that Malin Ackerman has an ankle tattoo so both of the women the ex-wife and the teacher immediately think that this is about her and oh what a horrible mom you know or stepmom she is and so you know Marsha Gay Harden is like getting in her face and telling her just you know what st- what are you wearing in the house? And she's like, nothing. No, not nothing. But you, I, not wearing anything that's like, uh, it's not inappropriate, you know. And but she's wearing shorts and she's got long legs. So they're like, well, what you're wearing right now is inappropriate. Don't you understand? He's a 15 year old boy, you know, and getting all upset with her. And so then they go out into the parking lot and she, Malin Ackerman, notices the water bottle trick happening with the girls. Yeah. Oh, well, the girl and her friends. And so she goes over and she takes it and the daughter is like, fine, go ahead, take it. But I'm going to, you know, you better not rat me out or I'll tell her where I got the idea. So she like blackmails her into covering for her. And so she does because she's, you know, a new stepmom, doesn't know any better and plays into the manipulations of a teenager and says she'll cover for her. Well, then the boy starts coughing. So Marsha Gay Harden is like, give me the water. He needs water. Right. Because this is all happening outside of the school. Like they're all getting ready to go home. Right. And so she, Malin Ackerman's like, no, I'm sorry. I'm just really thirsty. I can't. Chugs half a water yeah. bottle full of vodka. Right. Malin Ackerman is holding this this bottled water that only she and the daughter know is really vodka. And then Marsha Gay Harden's like, oh, my son's coughing. Give him that, give him that water. Like just orders her to give him the water, which I understand like it's supposed to be that she's rude and she doesn't respect Malin Ackerman. But it's still just like nobody would do that. Like nobody would just demand that you give her child your water, like no questions asked. But beyond that, yeah, we're talking about a bottle of water. Uh, what is that, like a 16 ounce, 12, 16 ounce bottle of water that's filled with what is in real life just water, but in the world of the show is vodka. And like Malin Ackerman just starts chugging it as this way of like, this is the only way I can be sure that they won't find out that it's vodka, which of course they will find out. Because she's going to be drunk soon. It's just, that's the thing. She like, you physically could not do that. But they do... Um, you know, she plays it great. She doesn't go overboard and do any Jim Carrey like thing. She just is kind of like silent for a second, trying not to throw up. So that's yeah. fun. I, I appreciate all that. And, you know, we've kind of glossed over because there isn't a lot of interplay between Bradley Whitford and Malin Ackerman in this episode. There's a little bit, but, you know, because it's a pilot, you've got to have the introduction of the characters to yeah. the main character. So that's what's going on throughout it. But that relationship is very charming. It's super adorable. Like I was worried I was going to be like, oh yeah, that's kind of oogie because he is older. But no, it works. He absolutely has the like boyish charm, the like preppiness that would allow him to, you know, be with a younger woman. What I was thinking was like, yeah, I don't think it's creepy necessarily because he's older, but like... The whole thing of this rich guy and how he's the center of this whole world, you know, that there's this whole little economy revolving around this one dude. Yeah, because he is absolutely useless at anything but his career um, and just, you know, collects women in ways. So that's why I say that this story is isn't really about him. Yeah. It's about the three women. Definitely. And their relationships with each other. And that's why throughout the course of the series, or throughout the course of the one season, it's the show is able to create tension amongst this like blended family without ever resorting to cattiness yeah. between the women. And that I think is what is so good about it's it. It's kind of like New Christine, old Christine, and old, old Christine. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I thought this was good, but I'll kind of go back to my original thing. Like, you know, I think you really struck something with me when you mentioned Cameron Diaz and, um, remember Caitlin Olson from, uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. She had her show around the this Mick. time, right. Which was different premise, but like, I don't know. There's something when Malin Ackerman plays this. And again, I don't think she's doing it badly, but it comes across as a young, pretty actress in this role that is a funny comedy role. Whereas a Cameron Diaz, a Caitlin, a Caitlin Olsen, you know, any, any number of actresses, they're just like... I don't, they're just more out there. Like, they're, they're just inherently funnier. There's something about her that's a little bit boring to me relative to other actors like that. Yeah, no, I, I get, I totally get what you're saying. I, I see what you mean. You have to fight against the trope, right? Jessica Alba, same thing. Gorgeous. She was almost quit acting, she says, after Fantastic Four because the director told her to cry prettier. Stop stop being so good at acting. Cry prettier. And she was like, the fuck is this industry? And I think, like, as much as it sounds like a whiny, like, you know privileged thing to say like I think sometimes it's hard to be the hot girl in sure. these situations because you want to do other things or you want to try and flex this muscle and nobody really is letting you and also in and maybe in some of their cases like do they really get do they really have the chops to yeah. do it and so I think going back to what we were saying about the class if you're looking for that special spark that's something that just inevitably is only going to happen in every one out of 10 one out of 20 shows you know it's just like through nobody's fault the the Malin Ackerman at the center of this you know like it just it it doesn't surprise me that it didn't take off the way a new girl or, you know, something else would. Trophy Wife, I've only watched this episode. All I can say is that I liked it. But yeah, and by all accounts, the show wasn't canceled because Malin Ackerman wasn't good. The show was canceled because it was in a shitty time slot and had horrible uh, marketing. Yeah, well, in general, again, like, TV's flailing at this point. Like, they're trying everything. It's it's hard. Like, it's hard to find these shows that stick. And, you know, I think that's also one of the pitfalls of having this sort of fluidity between movies and TV now is that you have these super expensive actors, you know, that, you, that you're having to factor in. You know, Bradley Whitford, Malin Ackerman, you know, Marsha Gay Harden. They're floating back and forth between this and Hollywood movies. You yes, know? and the price tag for this show because of those heavy hitters was another factor. Yeah, I remember listening to something about Studio 60 where they were saying the reason why that was canceled was the channel, the network had a notion of how expensive it should be to produce a show. And they just weren't willing to sort of uh, to accommodate the idea that some things just inherently are more expensive, but they could potentially justify it. So yeah, I could see something like this just, you know, uh, having a hard time. So I don't know, like, what do we think? Looking back on these, I have a feeling like you across the board maybe liked them more than I did. I think you're right. I think I definitely have a, like a soft spot in my heart for the class. I mean, I like I've made no bones about that for sure. But I also love shows that were like it's to me it's like the indie music artists that nobody else watched like i love to know about a show or be really into a show and be like man oh man it sucks that it got canceled like sports night love freaking sports night you know what i mean it's one of those things like people who know if you know you know sports night is amazing same with studio 60 it's freaking great i mean now i'm everybody knows my my sorkin love but it's not just that it's like this is my way of being like the hipster who like knows about the thing that nobody else knows about because I don't have that in anything else I don't like cool music I like Broadway I don't like like I don't I'm not in on the in crowd of anything I am a total basic girl with my pumpkin spice latte but these like one or two episode TV series back in the er specifically in like the aughts and the teens like early teens 
I had a TiVo. I had DVR before most people had DVR because I had a TiVo in college. And so I saw everything because I recorded everything. The The new season coming out, I would read Slate articles and be like, what are all the new shows? Okay, I got a TiVo this one on this night and that one on this night and do this and da, 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 da. And my boyfriend had a TiVo. So I made him TiVo different ones. So like I just watched everything during the early 2000s, at least a little bit. And so... I don't know. I just, I like those shows like this. And I like seeing all the actors in roles that we don't know them for. To me, the sort of shows how with these sitcoms, like just how unpredictable it all is and how the one thing that these all sort of have in common is this pedigree of the actors and the behind the scenes people involved. And you think of how, you know, in a lot of cases, especially with the actors, sometimes the pedigree is retroactive. So you say, well, they went on to do these great things. But nonetheless, a lot of these people were uh, kind of a big deal even going into this. And then by contrast, you think about something like Seinfeld, right? Nobody was going like, oh my God, you guys, Jason Alexander and Michael Richards are both going to be in this sitcom together? Are you kidding me? Like, they were (laughs) random assholes that nobody had ever heard of, you know? And same thing, you know, Eugene Levy's son is writing a sitcom about a gay guy that goes to live in, you know, some weird... Like, it's you can never predict the things that are really going to catch fire and the combinations of people and the way that a certain sensibility plays out with a certain characters, you know, a certain act actors, idiosyncrasies. And so, yeah, watching all of these shows, again, like understanding that even in the best shows, you know, you go and you watch the pilot for Seinfeld or or any number of shows and you're like, yeah, they, they didn't quite have it yet. So we always need to acknowledge that. But yeah, I'm like, you know, Lizzie Kaplan is amazing and John Bernthal and all those guys in the class. But like, Again, like I said, it just doesn't surprise me that much that this, for whatever reason, just didn't have that spark. And it's not that they're doing anything wrong. I guess what I'm coming to realize more and more is that it's the ones that get it right that that end up having that magic are the exceptions. Oh, absolutely. There, there's just... You know, you can create the circumstances for that to happen. And I think each one of these shows did that. And through no fault of their own, you know, and look, maybe it did happen and they just got canceled unfairly. But I think sometimes it's just like all you can do is go like, well, you know, we we did the best that we could. Let's let's try something different. Yeah. And I think particularly with the way that we curated these you know we purposefully looked for ones where there were it was a cast that it was wow either went on to something big or already had something going on so we were specifically looking for those ones that like were unexpected failures that had every reason to succeed you know in the ways that that they came to be there's tons of shows out there and i think these are the ones that are a little bit more interesting right that are nobodies or people before you know like a jennifer aniston in something before she had you know she had had like two guest spots on herman's head you know or something like that before she gets in some sitcom and there's a bunch of those out there too that are just bad you know what i mean like they had they they didn't have every reason to succeed they were a cast of nobodies and the magic doesn't hit but yet they still got the first like three episodes on the air or something and those are interesting to watch too for a different reason yeah, I will say for me, I liked the Jackie Thomas uh, Like that just, I think the premise is fun and I don't know. I, I You like that liked the one that I didn't like yeah. just to be freaking cantankerous. I guess so. Friends, send us your <laughs> favorite one season wonders. All right, so much for the one season wonders. What are we talking about next week? Next week, it's time to buy a fancy convertible sports car because we're having a midlife crisis. We're watching The Jeffersons, Season 8, Episode 5, I've Still Got It, Major Dad, Season 1, Episode 11, See the Hill Over the Hill. 
News Radio, Season 5, Episode 13, Towers, and Two and a Half Men, Season 4, Episode 16, Young People Have Phlegm Too. Yep, that's next week, and until then, we will consider this segment of the sitcom study concluded. Thank you for listening to The Sitcom Study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The Sitcom Study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. (laughs) 